are now entering Armbar Audio. Hello, and welcome to episode two of Armbar Audio. I am your host, Tim Farley, and alongside me is my trusted companion, John Jones. What's up, everybody? I hope you all enjoyed our first episode of Armbar Audio last week, Changing Horizons. So, with that said, let's get into episode two, starting with this week's news. So, starting off this week, we have a bit of a sad uh, story that broke last week. Uh, Former WWE star and winner of Tough Enough Season 3, Matthew Capitelli, has unfortunately passed away at a very young age of 38 after a year-long battle with a malignant brain tumor. Uh, He was diagnosed with the brain tumor in 2005, ending a very promising wrestling career. Um, The brain tumor was removed, but he continued to undergo yearly screenings, and in June 2017, he began to experience headaches and having seizures, according to his wife, Lindsay. Um, and after further testing, his doctor advised that he undergo surgery to remove another tumor that had grown significantly since February. Uh, Capitelli underwent the surgery on June 29th of 2017, and the surgeon was able to remove 90% of the tumor, but results confirmed that he had grade 4 glioblastoma, uh, he was hospitalized again in December 2017 and in May 2018. And after consultation with a neuro-oncologist, Capitelli ceased medical interventions for the tumor. Uh, he won Tough Enough Season 3 alongside John Hennigan, who went on to obviously become Johnny Mundo and Johnny Nitro and go all around the world. Um, and uh, Capitelli was actually training in Ohio Valley Wrestling and actually won the OVW Heavyweight Championship. Uh, Capitelli attended college at the Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where he was also a football player. And he resided in Louisville, Kentucky with his wife, Lindsay. So, uh, rest in peace to Matthew Capitelli. It's a very unfortunate and, I'm sure, very painful way to go. And I've seen so many loved ones and friends pass away due to cancers of all types. And I know how um, awful this must be for, especially for Lindsay. So I just want to say rest in peace to Matthew and he, I'm sure he will be missed. Yeah. uh, His OVW career was cut short because he had a brain tumor then as well. uh, And he beat that one. Um, Rest in power, Matt, and fuck cancer. Yeah. Um, so going from a death of a WWE superstar, we will go into two news pieces of new WWE superstars and possible WWE superstars. Uh, this past weekend, The WWE announced the signing of Japanese sensation Io Shirai at WWE Live Tokyo. Uh, She's a ring veteran of more than 10 years. Shirai has accomplished more than virtually anyone in the modern history of Japanese women's wrestlers. Tokyo Sports, a national daily sports newspaper, named her the country's top female grappler in each of the past three years. Boasting an exciting and technical in-ring style that combines speed and force, Shirai is renowned for her devastating strikes and suplexes. Nicknamed the Genius of the Sky, Shirai also packs a wide arsenal of high-flying moves, including an eye-popping acai moonsault. Shirai most recently competed with Tokyo-based World Wonder Ring Stardom, the same organization where NXT superstar and inaugural May Young Classic winner Kari Sane first made her name. A fixture of stardom, Shirai was a multi-time champion there and enjoyed two reigns with the promotion's top title, the World of Stardom Championship. Uh, Io Shirai was always regarded as the ace of stardom, with Kari being the second and Mayu Iwatani 
who has been showing up for Women of Honor as the third. They were the Stardom Three. They even made an appearance on a Lucha Underground episode, I believe, in Season 2, uh, uh, as Black Lotus's gang. Um, so there's definitely been a lot of exposure outside of WWE for EO. Um, we talked about her a little bit. I believe on the last or second to last episode of the Omega cast because there has been talks about bringing in EO for a good bit now. Um, in June, this past month, um, the WWE Performance Center held a tryout and there were some notable names who showed up for the tryout. Six foot five, 240 pound Thomas Stensman, an independent wrestler from Pennsylvania who has competed under the names Thomas Sharp and Blaster McMassive. Since making his ring debut in 2012, Stensman has wrestled for Evolve, Chikara, and Beyond Wrestling, among other organizations, and has crossed paths with the likes of Pete Dunn and Mustache Mountain. Puerto Rican wrestling veteran Nilka Garcia Going by the name La Rosa Negra, or The Black Rose, Garcia has won the WWC women's title three times, as well as wrestled in the U.S. and Japan. Jacob Schreiner, a former a independent wrestler known as Jake Oman, a 14-year wrestling veteran from Indiana, a protege of former WWE superstar Jimmy Wang Yang, Schreiner has wrestled in the U.S., Canada, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, as well as extensively for the Japanese-based Wrestle One promotion. He has also trained in martial arts, including jiu-jitsu and kickboxing. Terence T.J. Barnes, a six-foot-seven, three-sixty-pound former defensive tackle in the NFL, Barnes played college ball at Georgia Tech and spent four seasons in the NFL playing with the Jacksonville Jaguars, New York Jets, Buffalo Bills, and Kansas City Chiefs. Independent wrestler Gabriela Belpre, whose professional name is Gabby Ortiz, a product of the Ring of Honor Dojo and the world-famous Monster Factory in New Jersey, the same training facility that produced Bam Bam Bigelow, Belpre has appeared for ROH, Chikara, and the Japanese promotion Stardom. The British Amazon... Heidi Katrina Ale Alevi, a 5'9 independent wrestler from Essex, London, who is currently based in Japan. Alavi brings a background in acting and fashion and sports modeling, as well as extensive experience in wrestling in Japan, including for the Sendai Girls Pro Wrestling Organization, where she is a reigning tag team champion. Terrell and Terrence Hughes, the 23-year-old twins, twin sons of WWE Hall of Famer Devon Dudley. Both men played football in high school, and Ter Terrell qualified for regional and state competition in wrestling. Their sports entertainment training began in 2012 at the Dudley's team, 3D Academy, and the Hughes brothers have held tag team titles on the independent circuit under the name TNT. 2018 ACC Heavyweight Wrestling Champion Jacob Casper a two-time All-American from Duke University who placed in the 2016 Olympic Trials and holds 108 career wins. Standing 6 foot 3 and weighing 225 pounds, Casper has attracted much attention from sports media and WWE experts. WWE Hall of Famer and recruiter Gerald Briscoe even likened him to one of WWE's all-time greats, telling ESPN.com that Casper, quote, reminds me in many ways of a young John Cena. In addition to his accomplishments in wrestling, Casper has also been training partner for current UFC champion Daniel Cor Cormier, as well as, a form as former champions Luke Rockhold and Cain Velasquez. Velasquez, whatever. I don't watch UFC. <laughs> Tough Enough alumni Chelsea Green, a four-year wrestling veteran, and product of Lance Storm's Storm Wrestling Academy in Canada. You may also know her on the indie scene as Laurel Van Ness or as her name Chelsea Green. 
Prior to wrestling, Green was a standout in soccer, track, volleyball, basketball, and dance. She competed in the 2015 edition of WWE's competition reality series and has since wrestled in Japan, Mexico, and India, among other countries. She is currently on Impact, and I believe she's showing up in Season 4 of Lucha Underground. Green has also done stunt work in movies and commercials. A big name here, wrestling veteran Rob Strauss, a.k.a. Robbie E., Since breaking in at the age of 16, Strauss has wrestled in 20 different countries and 46 states and has captured independent titles throughout the U.S. He was also a finalist on the 25th season of CBS's Amazing Race competition series with his then-girlfriend Brooke Adams, or as wrestling fans know her as Brooke Tessmacher of TNA fame. Jeffrey Parker, a 16-year veteran, from Montreal, who has competed in Canada, U.S., Europe, and Japan, and has made appearances on NXT and WWE TV. Wrestling primarily under the name Scott Jagged Parker, he has won many tag team titles as part of the duo known as 3.0. Parker's 3.0 teammate, Matt Lee, also from Montreal, who is better known by the alias Shane Matthews. Like Parker, Lee is a 16-year veteran who has competed throughout North America and beyond, including for organizations organizations like Shikara, Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, and Combat Zone Wrestling. Rory Gulak, younger brother and former tag team partner of 205 Live superstar Drew Gulak. Rory was team captain of his high school wrestling team and spent a season with the Temple University team. In addition to coaching amateur wrestling for nine years, he has competed in independent groups such as Beyond Wrestling, Chikara, and CZW, and he holds a win over Zack Sabre Jr., 21-year-old Brandy Lauren Pawlek, better known by the ring aliases Ava Story and Brandy Lauren, a model and wrestler. Pawlek began her ring training in January 2015 and recently faced Lacey Evans on WWE NXT. And uh, we're not giving the full list, but this is the last name that I will mention as he is the current... Uh, He's on his second reign and is the current International Wrestling Cartel heavyweight champion based out of Pittsburgh, 6 foot 250 Michael Wardlow. He has trained. He was an independent wrestling champion in Ohio. He trained in boxing and jiu-jitsu. Uh, the guy has it all. Um, so, the next piece of news, John. Yeah, the next piece of news is actually something that I'm very excited about because as my partner in crime here, uh, Tim, knows, I love New Japan Pro Wrestling, and I also love video games. And I'm quite partial to mobile games as well because as the smartphones evolve, the games are getting better and better and actually being fun. (laughs) Now, this is a very cool piece of news. New Japan Pro Wrestling's latest effort to branch out into a new market comes in the form of their upcoming mobile app. The upcoming King of Sports New Japan Pro Wrestling app features a couple interesting in-game aspects to simulate actual wrestling psychology. For instance, if you repeat a move, your popularity falls and you need to be able to make sure your opponent gets ample opportunity to perform as well to help tell a good story in the ring. Mm. It seems like they took a completely different approach to this game than what was previously on the market, and that could pay off for them big in that regard. Players start the game by customizing their own wrestler. You can pick your own name and style with strong, submission, strike, and power as the options. Each style has a unique moveset, as do the weight classes, which lists five all the way up to Macho and Sumo. As you start the game, it's all about collecting moves to use on your opponent, and you have to tell a good story along the way. A player is rated by how much the crowd is entertained, if there is a comeback, and the variety of moves you use during the match. It's an incredibly interesting way to go about things, but seems so incredibly appropriate considering that it is a New Japan branded game. And our next to last piece of news comes in the form of NXT TakeOver events 
being permanently moved up one hour to a 7 p.m. start time. According to four to F4W Online, no word yet on if the change will be in place for TakeOver Brooklyn 4 during SummerSlam weekend in August, but it is definitely the case for TakeOver Los Angeles in November during Survivor Series weekend. It was noted that the idea is not longer shows, but that's probably what will end up happening. The current directive is that the TakeOver shows will be less than three hours in length. But they're always scheduled for two hours now anyway, and regularly go at least two and a half. And uh, our final pieces of news both come from Impact Wrestling. I'm going to throw it over to Tim. It has to do with the big Slammiversary event coming up. Yep. Two matches from for Slammiversary have been announced. Uh, first, we get a four-way international four-way match featuring Rich Swan, Johnny Impact, Bone Soldier Taji Ishimori, and Ray Phoenix, or as they call him in, in Impact, Phoenix. That should be one heck of a fast-paced, fun match. Another match we get is a grudge match, which started in PCW Ultra when Sammy Callahan tried to unmask or did unmask Pentagon Jr. Uh, this is a mask versus hair uh, match that is scheduled for Slammiversary, and I'll tell you what I couldn't. I'm very excited to see what happens here because if anyone can go toe to toe with Sammy Callahan right now, it's Pentagon Jr. Uh, yeah, so that about wraps it up for the news. Uh, this week we are covering two shows that happened this past Saturday. Uh, the first show we're getting into is CEO Fighting Games uh, did a joint show with Kenny Omega called CEO Cross New Japan When Worlds Collide. Uh, I asked my co-host, John, to do a little back research into the connection between Kenny Omega and CEO uh, Fighting Gaming Championships. All right, so <clears throat> anybody that knows Kenny Omega knows his um, unhealthy obsession with the game Street Fighter. So... <laughs> So much so that he calls his one finisher after one of the special moves in Street Fighter, the V-Trigger. Now, uh, Kenny's relationship with the CEO Fighting Game Championship started in 2016, when he and Xavier Woods, Austin Creed obviously, uh, attended the event and competed against each other in, in two games. They competed in Street Fighter V... And then they had a knockdown drag out battle in Dance Dance Revolution. Uh, one year later, in 2017, Kenny and Xavier returned to CEO for a special event called the CEO Royal Rumble, which was a Tekken 7 tournament. So, Kenny obviously has a very good relationship with the, uh, the event and with the CEO Gaming founder and director Alex Jabaley. So when asked about the the uh, CEO Cross New Japan show, um, they approached Alex Jabaley, which who is as I said this the uh, founder and director of the CEO Gaming Festival, and uh, he said sometimes attending the show of your dreams means stepping up and creating it yourself. That's how CEO became the world-renowned event that it is, and CEO Cross New Japan Pro Wrestling will be no different. Kenny and I have always dreamed big, and CEO Cross New Japan is giving us the opportunity to bring our dream to life. Combining our passion for gaming and wrestling has always led to entertaining moments for our fans, and we expect this show to really be the best of both worlds. And Kenny Omega himself was also approached uh, to give sort of a preview or like a uh, his thoughts going into the event. And he said, 
For the past two years, I've gotten the privilege to travel to CEO and enjoy my hobby at the highest level. Whether it be sponsored players that game for a living or spectators just there for casual fun, the FGC, Fighting Game Championships, has always made me feel welcome. With the upcoming CEO Cross New Japan event, my hope is to provide a new and fun experience for those that make the trip out to Daytona Beach and give back to the community that I love. The crossover potential for wrestling and gaming has always been strong, so aside from fully realizing that with CEO Cross New Japan, I hope that both newcomers to games and or wrestling can have a positive first experience of both worlds. I really think the fans are going to dig it, and I can't thank Alex Jabali enough for making it all happen. See you there. Now we're going to go into our review of the show, and um, I'm going to go ahead and just say right off the bat my thoughts on the whole thing. It was a really fun show. Yeah, I was going to say... Rome Omega said, I hope people dig it. I dug it. Yeah. I got the vibe of it just being a very fun one-off deal to get people really into it and excited. Yeah. Not it wasn't like, for the smart wrestling fan. It wasn't, yeah. you know, like that, you know, New Japan and ROH people, I mean, viewers are. It was for anybody and everybody. Um <clears throat> So, yeah, let's get into this review. Uh, the first match, we saw Rocky Romero versus J- the legend Jujin Thunder Liger. Liger defeated Rocky with a Liger bomb. I felt that this was an okay match. There was a point where Jujin Thunder Liger went for a superplex or an avalanche brain buster to Rocky, but it looked kind of bad. Uh, the ring the entire night was making a lot of noise. It was really it was squeaky. squeaky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And early in the match, I liked the whole uh, handshake spot. Uh, John, do you remember that handshake spot? Yeah. Yeah, it was like... um, Romero was trying to uh, get Liger to shake his hand in like the middle of the match. And Liger wouldn't go for it. So Romero shook hands and hugged the ref. Then uh, he yeah, like yeah, got yeah. the crowd to chant the, you know, shake Liger's hand. They shook <laughs> hands. Romero even hold, hold, held up Liger's arm, you know, and then there came heel Rocky Romero. Uh, you know, it was an okay match. I really feel like, you know, Jujin Thunder Liger is obviously past his prime. And, of course, he looks cool because his costume always will. But I think in the near future, he should probably have a retirement show. Uh, I don't know yeah. the exact amount I, of years he's been in the business, but I know in Japan, long they time. celebrate like 40 years or 30 years. I think Suzuki's 30 year was uh, last weekend, and he had like a pirate, he called it the Pirate Festival, and it was raining <laughs> everywhere. Uh, but yeah. regardless, uh, it's been a long time for Jushin because I was a WCW kid, and he was in WCW. He was on Monday Nitro fighting Chris Jericho and Hooventud for the Cruiserweight title. So he's been. Doing, he was on the first episode of Monday Nitro. Yeah, and so, wrestled Brian Pillman. So he's been doing it at least as long as I've been alive. So it's like, I think he's more suited now for. The New Japan Rumble before Wrestle Kingdom every year. That should be where he goes. <laughs> I don't even know if I'd, I'd. I mean, I guess, I guess, but that's, that's kind of like a disservice to him. I I would think, but but like, I don't uh, know. Because like the the New Japan Rumble always gives me the vibe that it's half serious and half fun. Yeah, like older guys, yeah. newer guys, dumb guys. Mm-hmm. And, but Liger is none of those. He's legend status. <laughs> right. So I don't know if I... I don't know. I just think he needs I mean, he's to... usually in it anyway, so... Yeah. <laughs> so our second match, we got the Gorillas of Destiny Love. of Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa. Yes. The sons of Haku. 
against Juice Robinson and David Finley. Love them too. Uh, <laughs> what'd you think about this? It was a good match. It was good tag team stuff. Um, a lot of crazy, like, outside the ring action, inside the ring action. Uh, David Finley just being a bastard, which I love to see when he gets to do that. Um, uh, the Gorillas of Destiny getting pissed off and trying to leave and then getting dragged back. and just It was a lot of crazy type of stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Tama Tonga ended up taking Finley all the way up through the crowd. <laughs> um, but the end came when Tama hit the ropes. Ducked under a clothesline from Finley, did his like creepy crawly thing on the mat, and hit his uh, cutter hit, finish. Yeah, kind of like what Hiromu does. Yeah. With the like slidey type stuff. It kind of reminds me of Hiromu and Randy Orton a little. Yeah, and like um, and like Kyle O'Reilly does that kind of stuff too. Yeah, and he hits hit his cutter finish on Finley for the win. Uh, both teams played their roles well. I love all four of these guys. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a pretty solid match. Yeah. Uh, the next match we saw the crown jewel of the Bullet Club, Chase Owens, against Jeff Cobb, who has been making more of a showing in New Japan as of late 2017 and this year in 2018. Um, I thought these two put on a good match. Cobb, Cobb was playing strong and stout. And Owens played to the crowd and pleaded with Cobb early on. Later in the match, the ref showed Chase a two count and Chase two sweeted him. So then the ref kept doing the two count, so the two sweets kept coming. And it was just a funny spot. Um, there was a big, beautiful diving elbow from the top by Chase. Uh, a hammerlock lariat gave Chase another two count. Cobb comes up. From the Lariat with a devastating headbutt that leads to the tour of the islands for the win. John, how'd you feel about this match? It was a good one. I um, I think uh, most of the matches of the night were good, so I don't need to keep saying that. But uh, uh, first time seeing Jeff Cobb, and I was really impressed. He's a big, strong dude. Uh, I think I think Chase Owens maybe spent a little too much time playing to the crowd. And um, trying to match uh, Jeff Cobb for strength, which honestly just wasn't going to happen for him. <laughs> right. So it's like, I don't know. I I enjoyed the match, but like I said, the whole show kind of had a fun vibe. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed everything. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the next to last match was probably the funnest match of the card. Oh, yeah. Rapongi 3K against Ryusuke... Ryusuke Taiguchi and Dragon Lee. Uh, this match started so funny. It was, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> Yo and Taguchi started the match and both kept trying to do the hip attack funky weapon on each other but kept missing. Then they both hit and cross, crisscrossed the ropes for like three minutes until Taguchi fell, uh, till Yo fell on his face. Taguchi ran over his back, then fell on his face. Yo got up, ran over Taguchi's back, and then fell over onto Taguchi for a near fall. Um, At one point, Rocky Romero came down to attack Taguchi, but he got sent out with a funky weapon. There was a lot of great teamwork by 3K. Uh, Dragon Lee brought the high-impact fast offense, at one point, jumping over the top rope, catching Sho on the apron with a Hurricane Rana to the floor. The match ended as Taguchi and Sho kept doing pin combination reversals, but Taguchi finally got a three count. This was a really fun watch. Taguchi is hilarious, unlike his Chaos counterpart, Toru Yano, and yeah, the commentary for this match was funny as hell. Uh, super fun watch. If if you like to watch entertaining and fun matches uh, and not take wrestling too seriously, go out of your way to watch this match and this card, but especially this match. Yeah, you you wanted me to to repeat something that I said while we were watching live when they were doing the crisscross in the the ring for three minutes. I actually said I can feel 
in the air, Jim Cornette just vibrating with rage right now. <laughs> because, They're killing the business. Yeah. <laughs> They're killing the business. Uh, at, what point, like, at one point, the commentary team were comparing all of their bodies, and they were saying how all three of the other competitors had great bodies. And then there's Taguchi. <laughs> and I think the, the commentator named Logan uh, said... Taguchi looks like he's made of spoiled milk. Is what he's <laughs> yeah. And it was like so out of nowhere, but like so on point. Yeah, and what and I actually said, like, I'm angry that I see what he means. Right. I'm <laughs> so the final match yeah, on the card. Main event. Yeah. The final match of the card, Los and Gobernables de Japón of the leader, Tetsuya Naito, and the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion, Hiromu Takahashi, against the Golden Lovers of the IWGP Heavyweight Champion and co-bringer of the event, Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi. Um, There was a lot of cool stuff. Uh, The match started funny as Kota and Hiromu started, but Hiromu rolled out and left his, uh, his... if you don't know who Daryl is by now, then you just need to Google it. He left Daryl in the middle of the ring. Well, we don't know if it was Daryl. It it, it, it it was a masked it was a masked cat Stop whose, name, whose name whose uh, name remains a mystery to this day. Right. <laughs> uh, so he left it in the middle of the ring and started it, it was pounding on the apron, like cheering it on. And Coda played into it as he was like maneuvering and around it. Over. It fell it over. over. Kota backed away. <laughs> uh, then Kota finally went in to <laughs> grab the stuffed animal, and Hiromu ran in for a quick roll up for like a one or a two count. Uh, a few of the good spots was there was a double suplex to Kenny Omega on the rampway. Uh, we got a cross slash to Naito and Hiromu. Uh, Abushi with a double Pele kick to Naito and Hiromu. Uh, there was a sunset bomb to Abushi. That was sick. Followed by a time bomb for a two on Abushi uh, from Hiromu. Uh, we got a dragon suplex from Omega to Hiromu, a tornado DDT from Naito to Omega, and a lariat from Abushi to Naito that left all four guys down. We got a delayed Oshiguroshi to Hiromu, a V trigger, a one winged angel. But Hiromu turned it into a Hurricane Rana. But then he got caught. Hiromu got caught with another V trigger. Naito gets in and gets a powerbomb assisted German from the Golden Lovers. This was a hellacious spot. Kenny yeah. set him up for a powerbomb, and Kota said, Give him to me. And he threw him into a German. Uh, it was awesome. With, there was a springboard assisted tombstone on Hiromu Takahashi, only got a two. And quickly thereafter, we got a golden trigger to Hiromu, and Omega and Kota both covered him for the win. Uh, John, what do you have to say? I, I have not, honestly, not much to say. It was just, it was, it, it's the match that you expect to see out of Los Angeles and the Golden Lovers, or anybody that Kenny Omega happens to be teamed with, be it the Elite or whoever. Um, It was a match composed of two tag teams that I am fully obsessed with, so I love to see that as the main event. Uh, (laughs) Hiromu Takahashi, um, you mentioned, and I, I thought about it, and I agree with you now, Hiromu Takahashi needs to lose the junior heavyweight title Quickly, because that man deserves to be in a main event spot. And I think he could easily move into the heavyweight division. Absolutely. If he wanted to. And I think that's what he needs to do. And possibly, is he in the, the G1 or is that just for heavyweights? That's just for heavyweights. Just for heavyweights. I. So that's already set for this year, but I'd like to see maybe next year if Hiroma could find his way into the G1. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know, Jujin Thunder Liger bestowed the ace title of the junior heavyweight division to Kushida. So yeah. Kushida finding that title at any point in time 
is acceptable. So put the belt back on Kushida and get Hiromu up the ranks because he has the charisma. He has the in He has the acumen, popularity, too. And he, had, he, he yeah. has the popularity. Um, so on the same night on Saturday uh, in Baltimore, we got best in the world from Ring of Honor Wrestling. Um, yeah, where like the rest of New Japan's roster was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first match uh, was the ROH three man tag title match between the Kingdom of Matt Taven, TK Orion, and the Horror King Vinny Marsilia against the other members of Lij, yeah. Evil Sonata and Bushi. Uh, what did you think about this match, John? It was a really good opener. I, I like I like um I like the three man championship as an idea. I like it in New Japan and I like it in Ring of Honor. And I think that it's, it's also in Lucha Underground. Yeah, in Lucha Underground. Because I believe trios are three Yeah, trios are a are Lucha Dor- Lucha. Are, are, are a Lucha Libre thing. Yeah. And um I think we could see this happen in NXT at some point because there seems to be an influx of three man groups in WWE and NXT right now. That's possible. You got or sanity. even 205 Live. Yeah, you got Sanity, you got the Undisputed Era, you got. Um, and also with tag teams, you could just throw somebody in there and make them compete for the three man tag team championships. They do, that on, they do that on Lucha Underground. The champions on Lucha Underground are currently three guys that they just threw t- together. Yep. So, I like the three men matches. Uh, the Horror King. This is the first time I've ever seen him. He's really cool. I like. Or him. I, I mean to say, uh, he's either the Horror King or the King of Horror. I wrote down King of Horror. Uh, he might be Horror King. I love his one knee pad is a Michael Myers mask, which I'm a big fan of. Yeah, it's I awesome. like that, and I like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, let let me get into some yeah. of the things I I jotted down here. I loved how all men were outside. Uh, and Taven got the crowd to clap as he looked to hit the ropes for a dive, but sat out and did the Naito pose. Yep. Uh, I think it's interesting to have the king of horror, Vinny Marsilia, on one side and a guy named Evil on the other. <laughs> These two should have a singles feud in the future just based off their names. Uh, great teamwork as Orion tags in on Vinny and hits a big spine buster to Evil, and Vinny comes off the top with a diving headbutt. TK only gets a two count. Uh, hilarious to hear a crowd chant, let's go evil. <laughs> evil kicks TK in the ass and tags in Sonata, and Sonata puts Taven and TK in paradise locks and two more big kicks to their posteriors. Uh, two counts on Taven. Sonata to the top, but here comes the red balloons from the King of Horror. Vinny pops a balloon in Sonata's face that gets him off the top. Bushi hit a double Rana on TK and Taven. Uh, the end comes with a rock star supernova to Bushi that gives the kingdom the win. The final few minutes of this match was really fun and exciting, with all six men working well as teams and hitting signature moves. Good opener. Taven has been on a tear since reforming the kingdom and coming back from an injury, and giving these two guys a direction and a platform. Ian Riccoboni said during this match, Taven has held three of the four active titles in ROH. I think at final battle in December, Taven will win his first ROH World Heavyweight title in a match with one of his best opponents. I will not get into that, because we'll figure that out later in the show. Uh, (laughs) The next match was Bully Ray against Flip Gordon. Um, The story leading into this is... Bully Ray beating up on the young boys of ROH like Cheeseburger, Eli Eli Isom, uh, Flip Gordon. Uh, Flip was a target, but Bully said since he served for the military, their beef was over. But Bully kicked Gordon in the nads. Flip is fighting for the younger generation here to shut up and get respect from a veteran. What did you think about this match, John? It was pretty solid um, throughout uh, Bully Ray eventually lost by disqualification by hitting uh, Flip Gordon with a low blow, which 
is unfortunate. Yeah, um, Bully Ray Flip uh, was really taking it to Ray uh, at yeah, the beginning. He, also, he had a pretty good showing. He hit two super, kick, super kicks, a spear. Ray went to the outside. He did a huge diving crossbody and then a diving senton. Then a huge springboard forearm from Flip covering a huge amount of distance. Um, the momentum changed when uh, they were came back into the ring and Ray, Ray clotheslined Flip. Uh, when Ray got the momentum, he just kicked... He kicked Flip in the balls whenever Flip went for a springboard UFO cutter. Uh, Todd Sinclair called the match. After the match, Ray bring in a chair and a garbage can. He slammed the chair repeatedly into Flip's legs, which are obviously his main uh, source of wrestling entertainment. Uh, Eli Isom tries to save, but Ray takes him down with the trash can. Back to Flip's legs with the chair. Cheeseburger comes down, gets some hits in before a last ride from Bully Ray. Bully Ray gets a table and sets it up in the ring. Ray takes Eli out and throws him into a post before entering the ring again. Uh, Ray hits Sinclair and sets up for a power bomb. This entire time, Colt Cabana and Ian Riccoboni are saying, we need a punishment Martinez. We need a Shane Taylor. We need... Uh, a heavyweight to come out here and stop Bully Ray. Well, as soon as Bully Ray goes for the power bomb, you hear the headset drop, and the uh, the savior Colt Cabana comes down. He grabs uh, the chair that's on, and he's on the opposite side of the table, and he keeps screaming, "You want to do it?" Ray lets go, of flip, pushes the table over at Colt, and gets out of the ring. Major booze at Bully Ray, uh, and big Colt Cabana chance. I, uh, this is the benefit of having Bully Ray in your promotion. Right. He knows how to put together angles and storylines, and he definitely knows how to get nuclear heat, making those younger guys more special. Flip always impresses. He is so elegant in the air. Colt coming down to help was foreshadowed by Ian and Colt saying, we need Castle or Martinez or Taylor to come down. Uh, this was great storytelling and psychology. It might have been just a minor little match on the show but right but what it means will impact ROH going forward yeah I'm wondering if we're gonna get uh Bully Ray versus Colt Cabana at some point it's starting to look that or way. maybe Colt Cabana and Flip Gordon versus Bully Ray and a partner of his choosing that'd be cool I'd like that yeah yeah although I don't know if anybody would partner would team with Bully Ray at this point <laughs> yeah, Devon's in an agent for WWE, mm-hmm. so he's not going to be showing up. And Tommy Dreamer's everywhere, and, but Tommy Dreamer. Although maybe is Tommy a, Dreamer. Yeah, but Tommy Dreamer's a lovable guy. He's yeah. not going to come in to be a prick. Yeah. He might. Uh, he might. <laughs> so then uh, yeah. the next match. I, 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 I don't think this is going to help Flip get booked on all in at all. <laughs> <laughs> Book Flip. <laughs> Book Flip. Uh, the next match was an eight woman tag match. Uh, this Ode, was good. Oda Oda Tai of Kagetsu, who is the World of Stardom champ, Hazuki and Hana Kimura, teaming up with R O H's or W O H's Kelly Klein against Women of Honor champion Sumi Sakai, Jenny Rose, Mayu Iwatani, and Tanil Dashwood. Um, John, thoughts? It was good. It was a really good uh, back and forth. Um, exactly what I love to see in women's wrestling. Bringing it back. Making it awesome again. Uh, to Neil Dashwood, who WWE fans would know as Emma, it has really found her footing since going to Ring of Honor. Um, the crowd still loves her just as much as the WWE crowd loved Emma. It's awesome to see. And or Sumi would Sakai, you say NXT crowd? The NXT crowd, yeah. And uh, Sumi Sakai is great. Um, they were the only two in this match that I knew, actually. Were the new one, Sumi Sakai. So, I'll let you go into more of the details. Uh, yeah, so, 
kind of wrote like a play by play, um, which I'm not going to say everything. Uh, there was a there was a lot of um, well, let's say this: the Dick Togo, Takamichi Noku, and uh, who's the other guy? Uh, What's that one? Who was in? Who was in uh, that group? It was outside of WWE, but Funaki. Funaki. Oh, okay, yeah. so Dick Togo, uh, Takamichi Noku, and Funaki always did this one pose where they would have a someone draped over the top rope, and they all put the boots. And posed, uh, and Kagetsu, Hazuki, and Hana did that to Sumi Sakai as they held up the Oditai plaque. Um, at one point, they tried to hit. Uh, Hana was holding Mayu up, but Mayu slipped out just in time, and Kagetsu hit her own stable mate with the stable's plaque. Um, this match ended when. My, uh, Hana Kimura missed a kick. Maya Mayu Iwatani connected with a kick, and she finally got her Dragon Suplex Bridge Pin uh, for the win for the Face Team. Uh, I thought it was um, a great follow up to the form- last match with the faces standing tall. Uh, the match went a little too long, but everyone got a chance to shine. Yeah, I. I- I, I can agree with that. Odi Tai work super well together. Uh, Kagetsu is a very uh, imposing and uh, uh, scary competitor, so it's good to have her as their leader. Um, Sumi and Tanil were tagged a lot because of who they are, and I think their in ring acumen. Um, Jenny Rose did a lot of just, like, quick pins or clotheslines. There was a lot of, like, in and out, in and out, just fast. And it was, yeah. if I didn't write everything down, I wouldn't have known who was, if I wasn't paying real good attention, I wouldn't have known who was legal all the time. Right. Um, but, you know, that's what happens when you get a limited amount of time and eight people in one match who work for a promotion that wants to jam everything into one show. <laughs> uh, so, the next match, John? The next match was Austin Aries versus Kenny King. Um, the story behind yeah. this match is that Aries wants to hold the TV title as he has never held it before. Right. In a TV title match against Silas Young, Kenny stopped the Beer City Bruiser from interfering but King grabbed the belt and hit Silas Young. The ref counted three, but head ref Todd Sinclair came down and rolled it a DQ due to Kenny's involvement. Aries kicked the referee in the groin. Kenny tried to stop and talk sense to Aries, and then Aries kicked Kenny in the groin and hit a brain buster. Kenny wants to be seen as Aries' equal. There was, th- there was a lot of good psychology in this match. I would say so. For sure. Especially when they would get to the outside. Where um, Kenny had Austin Aries up on his shoulders. And it looked like he was going to either slam him into the apron or into the post or something. Yeah, the royal flush. Yeah. And um, Austin Aries starts screaming at him, I'm your friend, I'm your friend. And Kenny pulls him off the shoulders, rolls him into the ring. And the crowd's like, what are you doing? You could have, you had him. And Kenny's telling to the fans, he's my friend. And Austin Aries, being Austin Aries, of course, took the opportunity to get a cheap shot in on Kenny. Yeah. um, (laughs) I really like this match because of the pacing and the storytelling like you were going on about. Right. Uh, Kenny King, as a serious wrestler... Is much better than the Kenny King we had as a TV title holder. Yeah, was selfie taking time selfie crap. time yeah. and all that stuff. Terrible. But this, where he's in a serious storyline and acting serious, this will take Kenny to the next level. Um, it feels like you can actually get to see what he can do. Right. Kenny needs to set friendship aside the next time he's in this position. Aries is a, f- a fantastic heel, an underrated heel in my eyes. I wonder if we get another match 
between these two, or Aries gets another shot for the TV title. Um, I'm not going to give you everything that happened in the match. Yeah. It was a really good match. Go out of your way to see it. Obviously, it's good if Aries is in it. Um, oh, yeah. The next match, we saw the franchise of ROH, Jay Lethal, against the time splitter, Kushida. Yeah. The story going in <laughs> is that Lethal was denied a title shot after taking some losses. He asked for a title shot because he feels lost in Ring of Honor without the title. So for months, Jay has been going to his opponents from the immediate past he lost to, uh, Chucky T, Punishment Martinez, Mark Briscoe, and Matt Taven, and has been racking up the victories. Kushida is the last opponent on Lethal's list to beat. Lethal beat Kushida at the 2014 War of the Worlds, and Kushida beat Lethal in 2017 in the rematch. Um, I thought this... This is probably my favorite match on the card. Um, we got heels tactics out of Kushida at the beginning, where he denied the Code of Honor. Uh, throughout the match, Jay Lethal mocked the Code of Honor thing with Kushida as he held his leg... Because he was working on Kushida's leg the whole time. He was holding his leg and he shook Kushida's hand. And the crowd laughed. And then Kushida was working the arm. And at one point shook uh, Lethal's hand. And the crowd laughed. Um, yeah, this was a technical, a very technical match. And you couldn't have two better guys in there to do it. Because Lethal has been wrestling for, for a long time. Kushida has been wrestling for a long time. These guys are very well experienced, and they know what they're doing. Uh, we got a yeah. lot of, uh, you know, the um, figure four and the Macho Man references, but not too much to make it, you know, like over the, o over the top, o overly silly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the finish had lethal. Uh, Kushida pulled Lethal up and goes for Back to the Future, but Lethal blocks and hits a cutter on the next Back to the Future attempt. He hits a Lethal Injection for the win. After the match, a real Code of Honor is exchanged. Um, yeah, Lethal looks like a real heavyweight now. He, he, must, he must be putting on weight. Um, Kyle O'Reilly may be Kushida's best opponent, but Lethal or Hiromu Takahashi are a close second. Uh, I imagine Le since Lethal has found his redemption, a title shot is coming his way. I agree. I fully agree. Uh, next match was a street fight between Punishment Martinez and Hangman Page Woo! for the TV title. Woo! I'll tell you, there was some there was some uh, hardcore shit in this match. Yeah. Let's, uh, the story going into this match, they were scheduled to fight in Florida, but Martinez attacked Paige before the match and put him through a table. In Toronto, Martinez had a chance to become the IWGP US champ on a man he had beaten in the past, which Switchblade Jay White, but Paige left commentary, taking a chair out of Martinez's hands, causing a distraction for Jay to uh, retain. Later that night, Paige was battling Silas Young for the ROH TV title, but Martinez interfered and hit a silencer on Paige onto a uh, sitting chair. A few nights later in Detroit, we thought we would see them have a one-on-one -on -one match, but Paige threw a chair at Martinez and drove him through a table. Martinez won the TV title at State of the Art in a, I think, a six-pack challenge type deal. Uh, so Silas Young and Beer City Bruiser come out, and Silas gets on commentary. Let's get into the match. John? So, uh, the match had a lot of really good spots. Punishment Martinez is awesome. Uh, Hangman Page is awesome, obviously. A uh, lot of... Were there... Were there any table spots? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there That's were table ended. spots. Um, chairs... The 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 barricade was used as a weapon multiple times. Uh, it wasn't in the ring very much at all. It was just it was an awesome match. I love 
I love street fights. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Silas Young had good commentary. Putting over both guys is tough, but also loved how they were torturing each other as yeah. he's eyeing a rematch for the TV title. Uh, Martinez zip-tied Paige's hands at one point, but Paige right. spit in I his face and battled out and broke the tie. Ch- there was a choke slam onto the guardrail, followed by a last ride onto the apron to Paige from Martinez. Paige hit a huge moonsault off the top turnbuckle to the outside to Martinez. Martinez went for a tombstone, but Paige reversed and hit a cradle pile driver. Martinez put tax in the ring, but paid for it when Paige back body dropped him onto them. Martinez won after blocking two right of passage attempts and choke slamming Paige through a table. I thought the ending came too quickly after the back body drop from Paige to Martinez onto the tax. That's just me nitpicking. Uh, this was a decent match. Uh, the next match was the next to, le- fu- next to final match, the ROH World Tag Team title match, the Briscoe Brothers, who are the champions going in against the Young Bucks. The story leading into this match was, during a match in Pittsburgh, the Briscoes viciously attacked the Bucks with chairs to cause a DQ finish. When Cody came in to stop it, they laid him out as well. The Briscoes say the Bucks are the best in the world at selling t-shirts and making YouTube videos, but they can't take the titles from the Briscoes. It seems like the Briscoes are jealous of the Young Bucks' international fame or something. This is the Bucks' chance to become ROH Tag Champions for the fourth time. The Briscoes are 7-5 against the Young Bucks going into this match. Now, John, I know prior to this recording you told me this was your favorite match, so yeah. go ahead and take yeah, over. Yeah, because I, I was just about to say, you said uh, Lethal and um, Kushida was your favorite match. This was my favorite match of the evening. The Young Bucks and the Briscoes are two of my favorite tag teams in the absolute world of pro wrestling right now. Um, I got to see everything that I love to see out of the Bucks. I got to see everything that I love to see out of the Briscoes. Uh, A lot of stuff with all four in the ring just going nuts and beating the tar out of each other. I love it. Um, The Briscoes need international fame. They need to tour. They need to do other shows. I don't know why they're the only Ring of Honor people that don't go to every New Japan show. I mean, I think they have here and there, but they... They have here and there, but, but they they're not more. constant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my thoughts on this match? The crowd was as hot as a skillet at Applebee's. Yes. Okay? And that was a major part of yeah. why this match was so good. Uh, not taking anything away from the four competitors, but the, the entire building was on fire. Yeah. Um, we got a few standoffs between all four brothers, uh, which was cool. Uh, the Briscoes did a lot of heelish stuff, like a diving elbow to the ref while he was counting a pin yeah. after the Young Bucks that hit a awesome. J with a, their own doomsday device and more bang for your buck. Uh, there was a Meltzer driver on a chair to J, but Mark broke the pin. Briscoes went for a doomsday device, but Nick springboarded up and hit Mark with an ace crusher. The Young Bucks went for another Meltzer driver on a chair, but Mark threw a chair at Nick that took him off the top rope to the floor. Jay hit a Jay driller for two on Matt. Nick was on the outside, and the Briscoes hit the super redneck boogie from the top to Matt for the win as Mark quickly stopped Nick Jackson from getting back in the ring. Just insane action and very fun to watch. These two teams are arguably the two best teams in the world. They, I think they'd be in anyone's top five or top ten. Damn yeah. good match, especially because of the crowd being so alive. Mm-hmm. After the match, Jay stands on Matt's chest and raises the belt. And Nick, who is on his knees, pushes Jay off, which makes the Briscoes put the boots to both Jacksons. SoCal Uncensored come down and act like they're going to join the attack as Daniels grabs a chair. But they swerve and attack the Briscoes and send the Briscoes away. I believe this happened because SoCal Uncensored are eyeing those tag belts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, SoCal Uncensored are definitely eyeing the Ring of Honor tag titles. Um, And that's a match that I'm excited for because I love Frankie Kazarian and I love Christopher Daniels. But I don't know... I don't know which duo would be going for the belts if they would throw uh, Scorpio Sky in there. Do you think? 
Um, well, the addiction's already an established team. Right. Uh, it all depends on where they want to go with it. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. Uh, so the final match was the ROH World Heavyweight title match between the champion Dalton Castle, Cody, and Marty Skrull. Yeah. My thoughts were, the new Skrull theme music sucks. The last one was more emphatic. It's actually, um, the new theme, it's a fan edit. I found it on YouTube uh, about a month ago, and it was the exact same song. Like, I think he used it hmm. as, like, a, as like, a, like a thanks to that. So, uh, I personally hope it's not a permanent change. I had a feeling that it might be a permanent change, because as we've seen throughout the match... Skrull is too lovable of a guy on being the elite and in the ring, wherever he's at, to continue to be a heel. He could still be called the villain. Yeah. And usually whenever a wrestler makes that change, especially for the first time, right, or the first time on a major platform, mm-hmm. they change a lot of things about themselves. We saw the music, which I said... It, the last one was more emphatic, but this one is very symphonic, yeah. which also suits him. But it does. My my taste is different. What, dude, that, and he came out with eye paint. Yeah, that um, mask the and the play doctor mask he's wearing at that show was sick. He his with the, his costumes were always with, awesome. It had like like half of it was gone where you could see his face. And it was, like, broken and, like, patchy. Ooh. It was really cool. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah. The first part of the match felt like two singles matches, Cody versus Dalton and Skrull versus Dalton. Right. Um, then it became a triple threat. At one point, Skrull had the chicken wing on Dalton, and instead of breaking it, Cody locked a figure four on Dalton as well. Dalton punched out of the chicken wing and fought off Cody and rolled out of the ring. Dalton wrestled with urgency and showcased his amateur background. Uh, Cody went for a low blow on his stable mate. Luckily, Skrull blocked, then slapped Cody's taste right out of his mouth. Skrull was going to go for a shattered dreams, but Brandy distracted the ref. Cody kicks Skrull in the jewels and rolls him up for two. Cody put on the ring and tells Skrull to kiss it. Skrull, uh, to all of our chagrin, did kiss it. Mm-hmm. But this led for him to grab the fingers and snap them. <laughs> Skrull put the ring on as Cody rolls out. Skrull runs at Castle, who catches him with a bangerang, but only gets a two count. And Nick Aldis pulls the ref. Nick Aldis wants Cody to win, so Cody would have to put the ROH title on the line right. in their scheduled match at All In. Mm-hmm. Nick Aldis is the current NWA champion. Uh, one of the boys jumps on Nick's back, but he throws him. Castle tosses a boy over the top onto Nick, but he just shoves him away. Castle is distracted. Cody comes out of nowhere. Instead of hitting the unsuspecting champ with a disaster kick, he jumps off the ropes and splashes down onto Nick Aldis. Skrull hits Dalton with the title. <laughs> Only a two count as Cody pulls so Sinclair mad. out. I was so angry. I was pulling for Marty to... I, I was hoping it was Marty's night. <laughs> Sinclair sends Nick, Aldis, Brandy Rhodes, and the boys to the back. While Dalton and Skrull are down, Cody grabs powder, and as he's about to use it, Marty gets up and throws Cody's hands into Cody's face, sending the yes. powder into Cody's eyes. It really doesn't matter as Skrull rushes Cody, and Cody hits a crossroads based on instinct. Dalton gets up and throws Cody out. Pin attempt for two. Chicken wing on Castle as Cody is wandering out, outside trying to get the powder out of his eyes. Cody comes in, picks Marty up for a crossroads, but Marty reverses and hits Cody with a ca- crossroads. Marty turns around and is caught with a bangerang for the win. Dalton Castle survives two Bullet Club members to retain. This was an okay match with some cool spots. Cody is a fantastic heel. And Marty seems to be going face. Maybe that's why they changed his music. Marty is too likable in wrestling and on being the elite to continue to be heel. Castle winning is okay, but his run needs to end as he seems like he's injured. Um, Castle needs to reinvent himself or something because he's 
since he's gotten to the top, his star isn't shining as bright, and I don't know why. Uh, how did you feel about this match, John? The match itself was good. The result, <coughs> the result is not what I wanted. I wanted, I I wanted Marty to win, but at the same time, I was right there with Nick Aldis. I wanted Cody to win because I wanted the match at All In to be elevated to a whole nother level. Right. Like yeah. it's a title match right now, but a double title match is like, damn, this is something we gotta watch. Right. Um, but yeah, the match was fine. Um, this show, like most ROH shows to me, felt too long. They crammed so it, much. It was a long one. They crammed so much in that it's just overwhelming at points, and I have to take breaks. If I took it match by match, though, it was a phenomenal card. Yeah. Uh, like I said earlier, match of the night was the tag match or the tag title match between the Young Bucks and the Briscoes. And the Lethal versus Kushida match. John, how'd you feel about this show? Uh, pretty much the same way. Um, it is. It was a long show, but for me, it flew right by because I'm so invested in the Ring of Honor and New Japan competitions. Right. I love those matches. So, um, yeah, I, I loved it. Best in the World has become a must-watch event for me every year. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know we don't like to post spoilers or talk spoilers, but if the said company puts it out there, we will. Uh, the next night at a TV taping for Fairfax Excellence, there was a four-way for the world title involving the champion Dalton uh, Castle, Matt Taven, the leader of the kingdom, Cody, and Jay Lethal. Mm, if there was a title change, most would expect Cody because of that all-in match. Yeah. But the redemption is finally complete. Jay Lethal is a two-time holder of the Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah. And I couldn't be happier because Lethal is awesome. So... If Cody wins the Ring of Honor title at some point before All In, does the double title match still... Is that still a thing? Uh, no. I believe no. it's just like a grudge match. Okay. All right. Still but, good. you know, the way ROH runs, they do a lot of TV tapings, and they right. showed with this, uh, this uh, title change, it could happen at any moment. But, like I said, in the first match review, I think Taven is going to win the title off of one of his best opponents at final battle in December. One of his best opponents is Jay Lethal. Yep. They had a feud over the TV title That's a true. long time ago, I believe. Um, yeah, the and the Lethal and Taven feud was was must was must watch TV. So, <laughs> with that, the reviews are over and we are going to get into this week's Big question. Now, the big question is a little interesting here. Uh, Glow Season 2 has hit Netflix this past week. So, I asked John... If, you know, and if you're not watching it now, watch it. It's damn good. Yeah, you definitely need to. Last night, I binged the entire season. Uh, anyway, so I, I asked John <laughs> if you could take a promotion or and... Or a show and do a Netflix like dramatization series of it, which show and or promotion would you choose? Yeah, I think um, I think that I went with hands down the most obvious answer, and that answer being WrestleMania one, a Netflix style dramatization of everything leading up to WrestleMania one. Would be amazing, especially with the stories that we've heard from Pat Patterson and Michael Hayes about um, about all the people that tried to make it not happen. You know what I mean? And as far as a promotion, uh, one of the most interesting stories and most 
crazy stories that nobody really knows what happened is the whole TNA mm-hmm. Impact GFW debacle with Jeff Jarrett and Dixie Carter where Jeff Jarrett leaves, starts his own promotion, promotes the hell out of it, does like five episodes, nothing happens, it never airs. It turns into a pyramid scheme. It turns scheme. into a pyramid scheme. He's in Impact, he's out of Impact, he's back in Impact, it's now branded as GFW Impact, then he leaves again, now it's just Impact. Like, what the hell? We need Netflix the to in- tell us that story. The in and out of Pan <laughs> Energy, the yeah. in and out of all the creative, right, right. Uh, Hogan and Bischoff coming in right. and trying to take on WWE in Monday nights. Uh, the stories about people not getting paid well right. or on time. Yeah, uh, I think it'd be interesting. That would be really interesting. If not a Netflix series, a documentary. <laughs> yeah. Um, my choices, uh, I'm going to say my, my uh, I'm going to go the way you went. Yeah. Uh, the show that I chose happened uh, on April... 13th, 1990, and is known as the WWF, All J- the World Wrestling Federation, All Japan Pro Wrestling, and New Japan Pro Wrestling Wrestling Summit. Uh, it happened in the Tokyo Dome. Um, it was on Nippon TV, but a lot of the New Japan stuff didn't make it to the original broadcast because Nippon had a deal with All Japan. Um there was uh, Juice and Thunder Liger was there, Snuka, Santan- Tito Santana, Kenta Kobashi, Misawa as Tiger Mask against Bret Hart, um, the great Kabuki and Greg Valentine, Jake Roberts, Big Mo- Boss Man, Masa Saito, uh, Chono, Ricky Chozu, Jumbo Serrata, King Haku, Perfect, Rick Martel, Janitro Tenryu, Randy Savage, Warrior. Ted DiBiase, Andre the Giant, Giant Baba, Demolition, Hulk Hogan, and Stan Hansen, among many of the names, and uh, uh, Toshiki Kawada. I mean, there, there was a lot of big names uh, from the Japanese legend and a lot of big names from the WWF legend. Not a lot is known about this. I would love to see how, how it was put together, how it happened. Because, honestly, you would think it would be good, but a lot of the reviews and some of the matches I actually saw were not good. You would expect Bret Hart versus uh, Misawa Tiger Mask to be like a five-star match. It was hot garbage poop sandwich. (laughs) Um, Coming off of that, the promotion I would choose, uh, so much has been said... And documented and written about of WCW and the changing of their guard so many times. And we got the Monday Night Wars on the network. Uh, Another, but ECW, the rise and fall of ECW has been documented as well. But I feel like a character like Paul Heyman and the characters in that promotion and all the things that Tommy Dreamer and Bully Ray Uh, have said about the money handling I think it would be fantastic to get a glow like series of extreme championship wrestling Um, and I could definitely tell you who I would pick to play play Paul Heyman and that's Paul Giamatti Uh, I think he has the uh, the acting chops to really you know uh, get that emotion just like Paul Heyman has uh, when he rallies his troops or he tells his lies, um, I think, yeah, that would be my choice. And so that does it for episode two of Armbar Audio. Uh, John, any last words here? My last words are this. If anybody listening to this has an answer for the big question, Put it in the comments. We want more comments. We want people to talk to us about the show. We want people to talk about wrestling in the comments. We want to spark the community that is wrestling fandom. And with that, 
Um, if you don't want to do it in the comments section, hit us up on Twitter. Hit us up on Facebook. We have a Facebook page for Armbar Audio. We have a Twitter for Armbar Audio. Uh, those will be in the description. Um, my personals are Instagram and Twitter, both at jkerns91. Tim? My Instagram is Farley underscore Armbar Audio and Twitter at capital A Armbar. Farley with a capital F. Uh, that does it for us. Wherever you are in the world, whether it's night, morning, or afternoon, you have a good one. And peace and love to all of you.